Hello all at Ideary 10. I wish that I could be with you today, but I hope that this contribution provides some tiny insight in the enormous offerings that you have in the week ahead. So, I am interested in speaking with you today about linguistically sustainable frameworks for interaction, and I'm drawing from a project in Johannesburg Titled Sustainable Multilingual Interactions in English-only Institutions, I focus on how an actor's language ideologies that see her South African indigenous languages as not belonging in an educational context, how they're shaped and challenged through interact the interactions of our project. I suggest it's, that it is through processes of adapting and renaming and writing together with exploring a synthesis of these processes in the body, that the actor shapes her language ideologies to pose a place of inquiry for South African indigenous languages in the educational institution. This is new writing for the forthcoming edited collection Applied Theatre and the Sustainable Development Goals by Taiwo Afalabi, Abdul Karim Hakib and Bobby Smith. The chapter in this edition is co-authored with Sibusiso Mkese, the collaborator on the project, but the presentation that I offer you today is before his contribution. In the final moments of the project that I will discuss in this presentation, I asked Sibusiso where he would place Izizulu on an imaginative scale of 1 to 10, with 10 having the most ability. Without taking a breath, he said 15. Intellectual. Yeah, so in terms of possibilities for intellectualism. 15 still. According to the census, Sibu Siso is part of 85% of the students currently enrolled in the South African education who do not regard English as their first language. South African higher education, like the rest of Africa, modeled itself on monolingual European or Arabo-Islamic universities to develop all teaching and curricula in one language. For South Africa, English has been the language of instruction in higher education, business and politics since the development of the multilingual constitution in 1994, despite pioneering policies such as the constitution that promises access to information across 11 official South African languages, the key domains for new knowledge have been confined to English for almost 30 years. This is a racist policy decision for the African multilingual context that continues the colonial view that there are superior and inferior languages. Richard Kishulo and Pamela Maseko respond to this issue with the term intellectualization, suggesting that the intellectualization of African languages is imperative if we're to develop the education system appropriately. Such intellectualization starts with the confidence and interest held by students to draw from their indigenous South African languages for formal and public domains of knowledge generation. Intellectualization is not so much about the existing quality and breadth of the languages themselves, but more about the support for their speakers. And it must start with students seeing and believing in the place of their South African indigenous languages in educational institutions. Such analysis moves from a language revitalization lens to a linguistically sustainable one. Calling on Alberta Bastadas Boada to suggest that the expansion of dominant languages without regard for the maintenance of linguistic diversity can have repercussions that are potentially as devastating from a social and cultural perspective as the damage caused by the economic expansion without regard for the environment. A linguistic sustainability mindset allows me to think about the future of the African context if our African languages were central to educational institutions. It helps us examine how this knowledge will change the shape of African innovation in the future for CBC Sir and those of his generation to lead on. To be part of, I remember in first year we had to adapt um, a short story into like a play and ours was in Zulu. And, and I, I felt, felt very inadequate, inadequate 
I felt like I was inadequate. I wish that like, there were there were moments where I was like, okay, if you were performing this in English, it would be better. And I remember really kicking myself, like, why is it better when it's English? Why are you not comfortable when it's your home language? So I found like I'm uncomfortable. I I don't know why. Like it's just and it's frustrating for me because it should be easier for me to act and express myself and be in performance, you know when I'm speaking my indigenous language, but I find that English is easier or I'm more, I'm acting more, or I don't know if that makes sense, if that's a thing, like, yeah. This was the first rehearsal of the postdoctoral project, Decolonizing Language Ideologies in the Body, at the University of the Witwatersrand in Johannesburg from March to December 2021. The hybrid project, which took place online, from our homes and in person and on campus, gen generally looked at developing methodologies that disinhibited actors to draw more widely from their indigenous South African linguistic resources, and as well as their embodied resources, for theatre and performance works. The intent here is to be left with new stories that better represent the language practices of actors in their everyday lives. This rehearsal came after the three month period whereby Sibley Ciso and I trained in postmodern choreographer Mary Overley's viewpoints as a set of compositional tools that can disinhibit the body to challenge language ideologies and mobilize multilingualism. And we've discussed this in detail elsewhere. The rehearsal that I've just played was the first day of a consciousness raising training and devising process inviting acting and musical performance students from the University of the Witwatersrand, Nonvuyo Butlehese, she, her, Moketsi Kogotle, he, him, and Nonflafla Precious Masumbuka, she, her, to explore the adapted viewpoints for a six-week period from November to December. The segment played features Nonvuyo discussing how she felt during the rare cases at the institution that, um, that had that the institution allowed her to draw from Isizulu, the language that she regards her mother tongue. She had just been plunged into darkness due to the South African internet saving system called load shedding, hence her video being off and all of our videos being on. So, so all day, 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 I, 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 I was, I was insecure. So, so coming come into bed, in the day, 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 and I was cool. So this video is an excerpt of the second rehearsal that featured Nambuyo discussing an event at her high school, where she was made to feel ashamed of her English and asked by the students to speak in Isizulu so that they could translate it into English for the teacher and the rest of the students. And this interactional sociolinguistics and performance studies methodology, which I've articulated elsewhere, allows a detailed view of how these language ideologies were signaled in this interaction. Numbuyo navigates a lack of confidence in English and Isizulu based on the English-only policies of the institution. Numbuyo signals language ideologies that her Isizulu doesn't belong in these institutions. Skipping slightly ahead, by the fourth rehearsal, Sibusiso had the actors writing poems about themselves in their first languages. In a moment that Nonflatla was discussing Nonbuyo's poem, she said that her poem rejuvenates and re-energizes me when discussing um, other aspects such as um, the poem, Nonbuyo's poem providing a sense of a yin and a yang whereby the, the yin was um, a, a sense of pride in her culture and her languages and people, and the yang is still um, a coming to terms with, with what these mean to her and how she can express them. When, by the fifth rehearsal, Nonflatla, Nonvuyo and Moketse were on the campus grounds, exploring the viewpoints together with key stimuli, including their poems played through a loudspeaker, the natural components of the institutional space, 
and the djembe played by Mo Ketsi. Mostly played that day during uh, rehearsal five was Non Flafla's poem, which she and Non Vuyo responded to physically using viewpoints as compositional tools. In both instances, Non Flafla and Non Vuyo legitimize each other's first languages within creative, performance, intellectual and institutional contexts. The affirmation for each other, as seen in Non Flafla's extensive analysis of Non Vuyo's poem in Rehearsal 4, or in Non Vuyo's presence to Non Flafla's impulses while improvising in this moment, provides opportunities for shifting through and reshaping new beliefs about the place of and potential contribution of South African indigenous languages in institutional contexts. Thus, the consciousness raising and poetry writing stages of this process already start to fulfill the intellectualization goals proposed by Kashula and Maseko. Sibu Sisu's ad adaptation and renaming of tools within the viewpoints were also central to this process of reshaping non language ideologies, which I'm going to briefly discuss. For example, Mary Overly's viewpoints consist of stems, space, shape, time, movement, and story. Yet Sibu Sisu conceptualized time as reliant on rhythm. In the earlier training components, Sibusiso laid out that there needs to be a presence of a sound in time in order to create an interval. He suggested that it was this interval that creates rhythm. Rhythm is thus the foundational pattern which actors look for, respond to and reform in time. Rhythm is the stimuli which all the other viewpoints, story, movement, space, shape and, emo and emotion are mobilized. Within this definition, Sibu Siso emphasized how rhythm is also culturally mediated and how differing rhythms are attached to each other um, and their language, languages and cultures. He clapped a 4-4 beat, for example, and actors responded Zulu. And then he clapped a 4-8 beat and actors responded Setswana. In developing this view of rhythm in concert with the actors via their interactions from rehearsal one to four, they use rhythm as the foundational viewpoint for the explorations in rehearsals five and six on campus that you've just caught a glimpse of. Rhythm became a culturally intelligible tool within Cebu Ciso's adapted viewpoints. In the sixth rehearsal, this is seen as Non Flafla and Moa Ketsi respond to each other and Non Vuyo's poem. In this excerpt, Non Flafla and Moa Ketsi have been improvising for almost 15 minutes, playing Non Vuyo's one minute poem repeatedly during this time. Before this moment, the two actors have been exploring the viewpoints largely on their own, and Sibu Siso, as a cinematographer, has followed them each separately as they respond to stimuli and impulses in their bodies. However, on one line said by Nonvuyo in the recording, the word beauty stimulates a movement where Nonflatla is more present to Moketsi. And see if you can recognize the moment here. <laughs> In this excerpt, after Numbuyo's word beauty, Non Flatla invites Moketsi into her movement, composing a spring step forward, spraying her arms around with the pull of a turn and clapping her arms straight. In this movement, the word beauty compels her to work with gravity to compress a sound. The body's ability to make sound creates a meeting point between the body and rhythm, and her clap in this instance was stimulated through her body's response to the word beauty in Non Vuyo's poem. 
This moment of rejuvenation and of close listening by Non Fluffer was felt by Moketsi as he responded with a movement and a clap thereafter. As the heat of the sun tore down on his body, he softened his knees and rolled his head from side to side as if taken by the elements. Such a moment is a metaphor for vulnerability as he stepped into the next beat, eager to develop a rhythm with Non Fluffer. Moketsi rolls his body forward, weight into the back leg, stepping into his right and crossing his arms over his body to sweep his arms upwards and through a clap. He finishes this movement with the hands slightly scooped, palms facing upwards as if holding the energy of the exchange and waiting for his next cue. Sibusiso holding the camera and capturing both actors in a long holding shot delivers the verbal cue, hmm, in line five here, legitimizing their actions. They show that they're listening to him by developing adaptations of similar movements, again ending with the clap. Sibusiso's definition of rhythm as it's seen in the viewpoints is being articulated by actors in this moment who develop their sounds to create more variation and cohesion in the intervals. As the intervals become shorter, the actors become closer in the understanding of the story, movement, space, and shape. Nonvuo is deeply connected to this moment between Nonflatha and Moketsi as her poem plays loudly on the university grounds and she watches through teams. There are multiple layers to be looked at in terms of how Nonvuo and Subusiso are each present in the exploration with Nonflatla and Moketsi through voice, camera and body, which there's not scope for here. But what can be said is that these multiple layers provide multiple new opportunities for shaping and challenging Nonvuo's language ideologies that her Izizulu didn't belong in educational institutions. The repetition of Nonvuo's poem, the responsiveness of Moketsi and Nonflatla to the text, and to each other, their placement on institutional grounds, and their exploration of rhythm as vernacular for the embodied languages being developed by the group are all seen by Nonbuyo on teams. The actors work together as to Nonbuyo's poem for 60 minutes, meaning that the poem repeats on the university grounds over 50 times. Nonflatla's previously outlined understanding of her poem and her presence in communicating it with Moeketsi creates an energy in the performance in this moment that charges the poem with meaning and significance on institutional soil. Nonflatla's personal engagement with Nonbuyo's autobiography, told in her Izizulu, saw them engage simultaneous protesters of speaking on behalf and speaking to her friend, knowing that she was watching. This double embodiment has potential for catharsis for Nonbuyo, the viewer, who can see the actors listening to each other, the poem and their bodies in space. Nonbuyo, while watching on a video call, was seeing her Izizulu embodied on campus grounds in fluid flicks of the wrists, sounds of the feet and hums of the student bodies coming and going. As the actors purpose to speak their indigenous South African languages crystallize in this moment of presence, Nonvuyo could see that her Izzy Zulu did, in fact, belong. I have presented how Nonvuyo's language ideologies that saw her Izzy Zulu as not belonging in the, institu in the educational institution were shaped and challenged over the process of adapting, renaming and writing and explorations in the body, thus creating linguistically sustainable interactions. Shaped through the writing task of an autobiographical poem in Izizulu, and challenged through peer solidarity, such as Sibu Sisu in his scoff in Rehearsal 2, or Non Flafla in, in her detailed and complementary analysis of Nonbuyo's poem in Rehearsal 4. Sibu Sisu's renaming and adaptation of viewpoints that was more culturally cognizant gave actors more frameworks to embed aspects of themselves otherwise not celebrated in performance, to speak to and for one another. These new performance languages are necessary foundations to nurture the introduction of indigenous South African languages into higher education. Any new language ideologies that emerge for Nonvuyo 
could be legitimized through the catharsis that may have come through watching actors respond to her poem in the final rehearsal. Her experience of the viewpoints in the previous rehearsal with Nantlatha meant that this exploration was intelligible because she'd experienced it in her body. Nanfuyo finished the project with comments, that, comments such as, it's the process connected with her heart, and I wonder what, what else will come out. When discussing the open-ended and experiential nature of Sibusiso's ways of working, but this isn't what I'm going to leave with you today, because it's too easy to find nice quotes that confirm our arguments. Throughout the project, the biggest burden, which is perhaps one of the reasons why multilingual performance with indigenous and minority languages happens less often, are the hegemonies that I bring with me as an Anglo-Celtic Irish Australian with a Global North education and very few South African indigenous language resources. The first video that I shared with you in this presentation featured the actors in the first rehearsal introducing themselves in English because of my attendance. By the end of the process, we developed a more sustainable approach together that, that recorded the session so that we could ha have translators go back through and translate what I didn't understand. I leave you with this not only as an example of where Nambuyo arrived at in terms of drawing from her Izizulu at the institution, but all of them confident of doing so with me there. And I believe that this is what linguistically sustainable South African higher education looks like. Thank you. And Give me, it was interesting because the more Sanjayalo, the more fears in his the more Ubuza, the more Velogu in your foot. 